Today's program will, will highlight three people's stories. Sarah Kohler from Oregon Sea Grant and Jane Harrison from North Carolina Sea Grant. Um, they'll tell their steps, they'll tell about steps their programs took to expand their applicant pools and broaden their intern and fellowship participation. But we'll begin today uh, with our feature presenter, Lamar Gore, who is refuge manager for the John Hines National Wildlife Refuge. If you've ever flown to Philadelphia, you may have noticed this series of freshwater tidal wetlands next to the airport, America's first urban wildlife refuge. For more than 26 years, Lamar has worked for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And today, Lamar will share some of his experiences and successes, including work at the Heinz Refuge and the Northeast Regional Office, where he worked to advance diversity and assist managers in building a more inclusive work environment. So Lamar, we thank you for joining us today and welcome to Sea Grant. Thank you, Anne. And um, thanks everyone for joining. And um, hopefully we all get something out of this today that um, can help us move forward in the world of conservation. <clears throat> so like Ann said, I've been working for the service for about 26 years, a variety of jobs. And um, over that course of time, I've um, served on a number of teams to try to answer this very question. Um, I titled the slide, Engaging a Changing in America um, as stakeholders in the world of conservation. And I say that because we generally know what stakeholders are in the conservation world, but when we start thinking about how do we engage and really, or should I say truly know our communities, um, we don't really invite those folks to the table. And when we talk about our workforce, we generally bring those folks in that we know or have experiences with. So these are some of the things that we have to chase down. I'm going to start with some foundations because this will provide some context, um, things that I've dealt with myself, and then relate it to um, what's happening today. So I grew up in Trenton, New Jersey. It's about 40 minutes from where I work now in Philadelphia, John Hines. And my childhood, I, mean, it, I was raised just like everybody else in my neighborhood. I was raised playing a lot of sports, and but I was the odd duck. My mother and father would find me down on the wetlands on the Trenton marshes and um, they'd come scream my name from the top of the hill and I'd get on my bike and I'd head home. <clears throat> so that's where I chose to spend a lot of my time. And um, I think the slingshot for me, or should I say that, that um, springboard for me was probably my sixth grade science teacher. And that sixth grade science teacher introduced me to some things that um, excited me in the outdoors. Um, there were a couple of other hits for me that, that helped slingshot me into what I'm doing today. But there were a lot of challenges that came with that. No one in my neighborhood, and I emphasize that no one expressed, they may have had interest, but they did not express the interest in the outdoors. So obviously there was a lot of teasing that went on. Um, even some, uh, some of that happened within the family. So those are some of the challenges that that you face even from where you grew up, the culture and ethnicity that you came up with, there are challenges there. Um, sometimes those are scars to our growth. Sometimes they're not, it depends on the person. Um, after I managed to, after I learned that I really wanted to work in the wildlife field, um, I went off to college, went to grad school and through both of those phases, I was taught to be what you see on the screen there, taught to be a shutdown biologist. And I call a shutdown biologist that person that, um, that biologist that believes that the, cons the conservation at large um, is about keeping people off the land. You buy the land, you restore the land, and you shut it down so people can't screw it up. So that's, that's what a shutdown biologist is as I describe it. Over the years, that's changed a lot. It's changed a lot because um, I've had a lot of um, leaders and mentors in my, in my days with the service that has opened my eyes to a little bit of what I'm going to um, talk about today. Um, so I set this up as a question to you guys, but I realized um, I'm not gonna be able to ask you questions that you can respond to. 
But um, today, the conservation movement, I would say um, it, it's changed a lot since when I came into the Fish and Wildlife Service. And it's changed a lot in that people um, generally understand that we have to bring people into the fold. And that means we treat people as stakeholders, true stakeholders that have a play at every turn in the game of conservation. Um, that doesn't mean that science, that doesn't mean that science is, um, has less meaning, but it does mean that we have to pay more attention to how we bring people along. This is how I look at the conservation world today. I look at it as having three heads. You've got land protection, you've got restoration and management and engaging people. And this, these boxes here represent how historically we have put resources towards conservation, different parts of conservation. Um, the people side of it, not having many resources. And I would say, and could probably argue successfully in some realms that engaging our audience and bringing people along is probably the most important thing. Doesn't mean the other things are not, but by bringing people along, it makes the conservation work at large more successful for us. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about the challenge. Um, I just pulled an example here, a survey that 2,500 people were surveyed. 1,213 of those folks visited a national park. 78% were of white audience. With the changing demographics that we're expecting, that presents a challenge for us. How do you get people to engage the resource, to fight for the resource, to vote for the resource, if we're not bringing people along? Um, another little example, I'm gonna have a few statistics here, not many. 1,900, 40% of the US population lived in urban areas. In 2009, 80%, that number is probably higher today. We have to think about those things. Um, I hope you can see these numbers. In the US Fish and Wildlife Service, this is um, an image, two images of our workforce from 2000 and 2017. If you just look at the changes that you see in 17 years, almost 20 years, there's not a lot of change. And the, the work that we've tried to do in increasing diversity in the workforce, and this speaks nothing to the people that visit conservation, play, conservation areas. So why is it important? Um, everybody asks this question. I have this question asked within the service, outside the service, and, it, and the story goes on. There's two main reasons for me. Um, one is the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do because we all benefit from it. Every one of us benefits from it. Um, and everyone values conservation land. I didn't put the statistics up here, but statistics show that people from all walks of life, all ethnicities value the natural world and taking care of the natural world for various reasons. There's different reasons. And I could list, I could put a list a page of reasons why I care. Some folks in the community where I work now, the first things that come to mind are clean water and clean air. So the first things that come to mind. The other reason, um, the challenge that we face is the same. We all face the same issues. We all want the same things to happen. Clean air, clean water. If we're not bringing people into the fold as the populations are changing to more of a majority minority society, then our, our um, work in the conservation world is a lot more complicated, more difficult. Um, I'm going to shift gears to, so what does diversity mean? We've had so many diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives in the Fish and Wildlife Service. It sometimes gets tiresome, and it gets tiresome because we're not getting at the root causes. And sometimes our language is a challenge. So when we talk about diversity, when we say diversity, a lot of times that's code. And the code that goes to people's mind is, oh, you said diversity, you're talking about black folks. And I, I say that and I laugh, and, uh, but it's real. So what does that mean? I tend to try to encourage people to, when they say diversity, to say what, they're, say what they're talking about, define it. Usually when I'm talking about it, it's cultural and ethnic diversity. That's usually where I'm at. Um, there has been some work done out there that shows and states that the first thing that we see when we meet a person, they could be a mile off walking towards us. 
we see the color of their skin and we see whether they're a male or a female. That's generally what we see. So a lot of other types of diversity that are very important, but those are the first two things we see. There are also those two things that we make a lot of decisions on in friendships, in work, you name it. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, the tools that the Fish and Wildlife Services tried and the tools that I've tried in my career, both in Fish and Wildlife Service, but also um, specifically down here at John Hines. So we've done everything from changing performance plans to try to fix the problem, forming work teams to, to take, the, take the challenge on, try to find out why we're not making any progress, um, coming up with new hiring authorities, youth introduction programs, as well as retraining our project leaders. That's been happening since I've been in the service and maybe before. Um, we got out of this a lot of training. Some of it, some of it was good, some of it was worthless, um, but the root of the issue is the battles that we have within. We all have battles within that we, we don't really take on. When we hire, oh, I gotta go back there. When we hire or we develop a program, we tend to lean on what's comfortable for us. We approach it in a way where, and I'm gonna use recruitment because recruitment's the best place to do it. If any of you do recruitment, um, hopefully you're like me looking in the same mirror. Um, we hire who we know, people who run this, in the same circles that we run in, they're in the clubs that we're in, they look like us or they like the things that we like. That's who we choose to hire. It eats our lunch in trying to um, build a diverse workforce because if we're constantly thinking in those realms and we're not intentionally thinking about how we could do it another way, we continue to step backwards. Then we have our workplace and organizational culture challenges. And I'm guilty of this too. If I'm not intentionally thinking about it, it's when we're going out to recruit and I'm talking to my superior, it's I need somebody that's gonna come in here and hit the ground running. Um, or these folks are not familiar with what we need to have going right now, or they don't understand our work culture. These are just excuses excuses that um, people in my organization, I've heard these conversations many times, they're the things that they put out there and um, they justify hiring those folks that they know. And it's usually those folks that have been training at their station as an intern and when they put a job on the table, they bring those folks in. So if we don't somehow start to get a feeder group coming in from K through 12, then that pool that we're scooping from is never going to change. Um, I do believe that the most effective results we're going to get are going to come from our leadership. Not everybody believes that. And, um, and I don't say it's 100% in leadership. We've got probably, um, I'm going to say like a 60-40 because we need leadership from the bottom, but we also need our leaders holding our hiring officials accountable. So in the service, and here, well, I'll say in the service first, in the Fish and Wildlife Service, that list of items that I put up on the screen before is really how we approach it. Here at John Hines, um, we use a multi-tiered approach to try to take on um, recruiting for diversity, but also engaging a diverse audience and making sure that everyone is a part of the stakeholder group. When I say a part of the stakeholder group, that means those folks feel like they're part of the process and how we run programs here, um, how we do hiring here, and how we engage with them in their communities. So we approach it with environmental education at K through eight, interpretation with, um, and community engagement in the community, not doing it just at the refuge, but in the community. Um, our high school program is our YCC program, and career discovery internship program is a college age program. And um, also doing intentional recruitment. And intentional recruitment to me means that you're not doing a recruitment two weeks before you put the job on the street. Recruitment's happening all year long. And that means um, continuing to run in the circles of the schools that you want to recruit from or in the neighborhood that you want to recruit from or the city that you want to recruit from. It means you're constantly talking to and working with those groups. That's real recruitment. 
I can tell you for half of my career, recruitment was taught to me as, okay, you got a job, you got a job you want to recruit for, you get the package together, you send it to HR, and they put it on the street. That was recruitment. That's advertising now. Um, we have to keep relationships going if we're going to recruit and re recruit intentionally, which means you're targeting an audience. This is how we look at that. I designed this about, oh, I'm going to say seven or eight years ago. And it's just really a visual representation of um, how you, when you touch kids for the first time in that initial engagement phase, how you marshal them through the, I'll say career through employment, marshal them through this ladder, which I call a youth engagement ladder, to employment. So how do they get from one point to the other? People can answer this at any point in the scale, but we think about it intentionally when we have our environmental education kids from K through eight, we were thinking about which of those kids would fit well in our high school program, and then which of them will fit well in our college age program, and it goes on and on. That's intentionally thinking about building your um, applicant pool, and we're targeting that pool. Our education program, I'll hit this very quickly, consists of, uh, we targeted just a few schools, and we hit those kids um, 17 times a year, in classroom and at the refuge. And we, are, we look at it as building stepping stones of engagement. That's our programming. So you're feeding the kids with the things that they can reach at the place where they happen to be. So you're meeting people where they are. So if they, if they have some discomfort, you meet them where they are, and you begin to bring them up to the point where they have a fuller understanding of the conservation world. I'm not going to go into detail on that. I have a lot of things on this slide, but I want to get through this. Um, we also do engagement with a purpose. We work with the community deliberately, intentionally, to build a relationship where the community looks at us as a part of the community, not an adjunct to the community. So we're involved off-site in the things that they care about in the community. And um, that helps us build a relationship to where they come out to the refuge youth training that we do. I'm not going to go into too much here because I'm going to jump into it um, at the next slide. Um, but the youth training programs are designed to make sure that we are pulling students from the neighborhoods in which we serve. Our high school programs specifically are designed to build conservation-minded and active citizens. Citizens that are active, neighborhood citizens, um, that are active in their community and active here at the refuge or other places um, in the city. We want them to build the conservation skills, problem solving. I'm not going to read through all of these. Ultimately, it will also help us to build the applicant pool. Very important. And all of these things work together. Career Discovery Internship Program is a program started back in 2008, designed to introduce freshmen and sophomore culturally and ethnically diverse kids to the conservation world. We use our high school program on, from the previous slide to migrate those kids into the career discovery internship program. Um, I started working on this particular program when I was in the regional office. When I came down here, I continued to work with this program. The, um, the program is designed to pluck kids, not specifically science, kids that are in science, we're looking for any kids that are interested in coming to try something new. And the reason why we looked at it like that, we cast the net like that, is because we felt as though <clears throat> before they came to college, no one's probably cast the net and said, would you be interested in conservation? So we're bringing everyone in. So they're being introduced to the conservation world. We're providing them this immersive experience to get a full understanding of the conservation world. We provide the mentors to help them deal with challenges during their work experience. And it also allows for us to train our staff. And that's because we do the, we do the recruitment from the regional level. It allows us to um, give our staff the opportunity to work with culturally and ethnically diverse youth. And we evaluate that. We evaluate it at three levels. 
And you see that at the bottom of the screen there, we evaluate our orientation program. So that's really an onboarding week in which we're working with those kids. And we do diversity and equity, equity and inclusion training with them and just prepare them for the, what they're about to walk into. We also um, evaluate our permanent staff. How are they inter interrelating with the, with the students? And we evaluate the student's experience. Our staff don't see the student evaluation of their station, only the coordinators do. And that helps us to improve what's happening on field station. I'm gonna jump back in 2011, and this all lines up. The Fish and Wildlife Service did a vision document. That vision document was um, put in place to set the stage for where the service is going over the next 15 to 20 years. I was assigned to the relevancy team. And um, we're trying to figure out how do you keep the service relevant in a changing demographic in America? That program birthed what we're doing at John Hines here, which we call the Urban Wildlife Conservation Program. And it's designed to reach urban communities. Just so happened that the community right outside our front gate here, it's probably about 90% um, African American, or maybe about 80 to 90% African American. The other side of the refuge um, is a much more diverse, ethnically diverse community. Um, we came up with these standards of excellence. Most people call them the urban standards of excellence, and so that's how they were designed. And I asked this, no, you can't ask, answer this question. When you look at this, um, this does not just apply to urban communities. It applies anywhere. This is just good practice. But in the conservation world, we're either not taught this or we struggle with it for some reason. Um, I highlighted no and relate to community because that's the foundation of how we engage with a community that we don't look like and the conservation world does not look like the community that we serve here. Um, at Hines, we've broken that into three categories, and that's education, environmental education, engaging communities, and breaking down transportation barriers, all three of which are gaps in the conservation world. Um, I say know our audience all the time. You'll always hear me saying that um, because it's important for us to know how to approach the recruitment. The biggest challenge that we face in taking that on and knowing the audience and doing the recruitment is looking in the mirror and see what we bring into the room. This is our biggest issue. It's, um, it's, none, of, it's none of those issues that I, I listed before that the Fish and Wildlife Service has tried to do. It's um, dealing with the barriers that all the individuals that recruit for, that engage, that are our friends, our partners, our volunteers, those barriers that walk into the room when you're meeting a new person, you're meeting a new audience, meeting a new neighborhood, or you're recruiting someone. And this leads to retention issues. Um, we can recruit culturally and ethnically diverse people. We know how to do that. We've done it. I have seen throughout my career, more folks come in that leave within a year because there are challenges that people bring into the room with them. Some folks honestly don't want them around. Some folks don't know how to engage. So it's a little cold. There's all kinds of reasons, but we need to spend more time. We have to spend more time looking in the mirror to see what we bring in the door. That stuff has to be checked at the door. Um, at my staff specifically, there, there were issues with just going into the communities to work with the communities that we serve because they were unsure if it was going to be safe for them. And we've been doing this for about four years now since I've been down here, and uh, we haven't had any incidences. I don't expect to have incidences any more so than you would have anywhere. Um, so that's something we have to deal with. Um, we have looked at uh, everything that you see here. I've, I've kind of gone through this already. Looked at um, changing performance plans. Um, trying to get our managers to know the audience and continuing to recruit. That's that intentional recruitment that happens all year long. The student programs I've described there, the Fish and Wildlife Service was difficult to convince that we needed to put more money 
into our education and our youth recruitment programs because they're expensive. They're very expensive programs. How I try to sell that to the conservation world, the conservation community, is to talk about the long game. When we, we get a student that comes in for an internship, if they're still in high school, you're looking at five, six, seven years down the road before you may see um, a conversion into the conservation world come. And the reality is um, Congress and the leaders in Fish and Wildlife Service and, and probably on boards of nonprofit organizations, they're looking for immediate success. But that's not the success that's going to take us to where we need to be, to be more relevant with where America is going. Um, a success story for me, and this is the story that I sell, is yes, it's a conversion. It's great to get someone converted, but it's also, you sent that person home to school, um, to spend time with friends, and they're sharing a conservation story. And the person they share with, or they themselves, they may sit on a town planning board one day. Would you, wouldn't you like to have someone sitting on a town planning board um, that has some influence that can influence that board? And the story, the, that list goes on and on and on. That's our target. I'm gonna stop there. Hopefully I didn't go too long. I don't know if you guys wanna do questions now or you want to um, hold tight. Um, and before you answer that, I forgot to mention the, the um, CDIP program, the Career Discovery Internship Program, since we were working on it, has turned out about 21, 22 permanent employees with Fish and Wildlife Service. But then there's other students that have gone on to work for Park Service. One of them started her own film company that does wildlife photography around the world. Um, all of those are success stories, but even the ones that didn't come on board in the conservation, some of those folks are still involved and engaged. So I turn it back over to you, Anne. Thank you so much, Lamar. So um, if anyone has a clarifying question, please uh, ask it in the chat room. Uh, otherwise, uh, we'll hold questions till the end. Okay. And Catherine, do we have any questions for uh, clarifying questions at this point? Um, we have one just, um, it's not necessarily clarification, but just specific to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife. Okay, well, let's, let's uh, hold that until the end and uh, we'll discuss it. Uh, so thank you again, Lamar. This was just so uh, illustrative, <laughs> illustrative and uh, quite, a, quite a great success story. Um, our next speaker will be Sarah Kohler, Kolasar, and uh, she will relate a few of the steps that her program has taken. So I'll turn the program now over to Sarah. Unmuted. Uh, thanks, Anne, and uh, thank you, Lamar, uh, for that uh, inspiring presentation. Uh, tough act to follow from uh, Oregon Sea Grant, but uh, my name is Sarah Kolasar, as Anne said, and I am the uh, program leader for Oregon Sea Grant's Research and Scholars Program. So today, uh, I'm going to talk about um, a little bit of work that the scholars program in particular here at Oregon Sea Grant has engaged in. Um, I want to point out that um, these are some, I would call them initial or preliminary efforts uh, and that certainly uh, even though I'm the one who's delivering this presentation, I have not been working on these efforts by myself um, and there are other members of uh, both past and uh, current members of the, uh, the team here at Oregon Sea Grant who've been involved in these efforts. And you'll have to excuse me if I'm doing any mousing, it's because I'm letting people in from the waiting room while I'm giving my presentation. So it's not because I'm typing emails. Uh, okay, so uh, just a couple of slides to talk about our efforts here at Oregon Sea Grant. Uh, and I say these as our diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts so far. 
Um, when Ann first put the agenda together for this presentation, she was saying that I would be sharing our successes. Uh, I am uncomfortable with calling anything that we're doing currently a success uh, because I feel like these are really preliminary uh, and hopefully ongoing efforts. Um, but, um, you know, I, I didn't want the lack of perfection in what we're doing to be a barrier for starting. Um, and so we've really uh, been thinking about diversity, equity, and inclusion specific to our scholars program, um, I would say for maybe the past two and a half to three years. Um, <clears throat> so relatively recently. Um, but here at Oregon Sea Grant, um, in addition to the national fellowships, we have a state fellowship program that supports both uh, undergraduate students and graduate students. Um, and so this is my current sphere of influence. Um, and so where uh, we've decided to start efforts, um, working towards trying to expand the diversity of uh, students who we support with our program. Um, so what we decided to do was to start with our undergraduate programs. Um, you know, Lamar, I, I think really highlighted the fact that uh, engaging students uh, as early as possible is really important. Um, and I am completely aware that, you know, many undergraduates already have faced barriers uh, to getting to where uh, they might want to be. Um, but uh, that's, you know, sort of the landscape under which we operate. So, um, so we've decided to start with our undergraduate summer scholars program. Um, and we recruit students. This is similar to an REU program, research experience for undergraduates, um, but focused on agency experiences uh, for undergrads. We recruit across the country and uh, we have typically about 10 students per summer. Um, it's a 10 week program in the summer where students work for various NGOs or agencies uh, or other uh, program partners. Um, and so we have really decided to uh, focus efforts for that undergraduate program. Uh, one of the things that we've done in the last couple of years is include uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion as an intentional part of the vision, mission, and goals for our programs. Um, uh, next, we've been really trying to uh, focus on developing relationships with different cultural groups. Um, you know, I really liked the way Lamar set up the difference between advertising and, uh, you know, intentionally recruiting. Um, I think I, I've written it as we've advertised opportunities to diverse cultural groups and we're just starting to build those relationships uh, for more intentional uh, engagement and recruitment. Um, we're also trying to highlight for our students the importance of diverse perspectives and diverse backgrounds. So we um, ask questions that are pertinent to diversity, both in the application stage and in the interview. Um, and, you know, our undergrad applicants have been uh, really insightful in their answers to these questions um, and then thinking about, you know, how that carries over to their work as a Sea Grant Scholar. Uh, we have recently started to collect some uh, voluntary demographic information from our students uh, to establish a baseline of who are the students who are reaching, who are the students who are serving, and, um, you know, just to know a little bit more about our applicant pool. And then uh, my final point on this slide is just to mention, um, and this is a, a, a question that I uh, definitely hope that we can get at in our discussion, is about partnering um, and just the simple fact that we can't uh, do this all by ourselves. And so that um, here at Oregon Sea Grant in our scholars program, you know, we've been partnering with uh, folks in our local communities, some of our agency partners who help host our students, uh, people at the university level um, here on campus at Oregon State University, as well as nationally uh, throughout the Sea Grant network efforts, but then also trying to engage with other partners um, outside uh, beyond Sea Grant, but other uh, agencies and organizations that have similar missions or commitments to uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, this is a lot of text on a slide, uh, but I just wanted to show 
what some of our uh, our language that we've developed around uh, our vision for our scholars program. So having a diverse, you know, working towards a diverse ocean workforce um, to understand technical and social challenges that face coastal communities in the natural environment. Uh, the uh, mission statement for our scholars program uh, to increase the number and diversity of higher education graduates who are ready to tackle careers uh, or graduate school in marine science and policy. Um, and then some goals, three goals that we have uh, to prepare students uh, to support the shared initiatives with our partner agencies and also to promote uh, inclusion of diverse perspectives into problem solving uh, here in Oregon. And you can read more about these uh, on our website. Uh, well, I guess I should use the pointer and not my gigantic hand uh, um, here uh, at the top. Um, so uh, this is one of the questions that we've been using uh, for the past few years when we are recruiting students into our scholars program is we ask students in an essay or and or in an interview to reflect on how experiences interacting with diverse groups of people inform their work or would inform their work as an Oregon Sea Grant scholar. My phone in my office never rings. And of course it rings when I'm on a webinar. Apologies. Uh, as I mentioned, we've begun collecting baseline demographic data. Um, and one thing that we're really hoping to start this year is to provide some DEI diversity information for our mentors um, you know, whether this is in the form of training or just conversations, we began conversations last year with some of our uh, new and also returning mentors, but just creating a community for these undergraduate students of people who understand what we mean when we're talking about increasing diversity, why that's important in terms of uh, students feeling included at these agencies, at their workplaces, um, and then how that reflects in, excuse me, retention of uh, of students uh, as they move through their careers and decide, you know, whether careers in uh, coastal science, coastal policy might be for them. Um, this is my last slide um, and just a shout out. Uh, again, this is not just my work, but this is work that the Sea Grant Network has been engaged in uh, in terms of collaborating with other folks. Um, I've been finding that, you know, as I'm stumbling, as we're stumbling our way through uh, efforts to include diversity uh, in our scholars program, you know, just opening those conversations with other partners. Uh, for example, NOAA Fisheries was a new partner, a new host for our summer scholars this year. Um, and so that kind of opened the door to having conversations with folks in the NOAA office in Portland, um, how they might be able to attract or retain uh, students from diverse backgrounds into some of their programs. Um, potential connections with our local chapter of the American Fisheries Society um, and some of the uh, other people on this webinar, including Jane Harrison, have been involved with uh, early conversations with the Coastal and Estuarine Research Federation, uh, one of our um, partner uh, organizations, about uh, shared interests in webinars and trainings like this. Um, and so how we can build on that shared expertise uh, to provide training or programming or information to a broader audience. So I am going to stop there. Um, and I guess at this point, uh, turn it back over to Anne uh, to MC while I pull up Jane Harrison's presentation. Um, but thank you all for joining today. So our next presenter today will be Jane Harrison from North Carolina Sea Grant, and she is going to do a similar presentation to talk about uh, steps that North Carolina Sea Grant has taken. So uh, are you there, <laughs> Jane? You with us? I'm not sure that she's... Are you muted, Jane? So I don't think, I think Jane may not be with us now. Uh, I think she may have, she was calling in on the telephone. Sarah, do you see, uh, 
Any sign of Jean? Uh, let me find her. Okay. Uh, let's see. Advantage participants. Jane, I think you are now unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> um, so thanks everyone for being here today. Um, I'll uh, try to wrap up the presentations. Um, thank you so much, Lamar, for being with us and starting this off, and Sarah for talking a little bit about your efforts at Oregon Sea Grant. I agree that the word effort is uh, more apt than success. <laughs> we are all putting effort towards DEI and uh, success is gonna happen over the long term, but it'll be incremental. Um, so the, I just have two slides I wanna share and it's really to talk about a program that I've had the um, opportunity to work with um, just one time. So this program is the Diversity and Conservation Internship Program and it's run by the Conservation Trust for North Carolina. And they started back in 2008, they've been running for about 10 years now, and it's focused on students of color, so focusing outreach to North Carolina's 10 historically black colleges and universities. And really the you know, impetus for the program was to introduce promising students to careers in conservation, to introduce these organizations, conservation organizations, to promising students, um, and then as well to really create an employment pathway that promotes greater diversity and inclusion and conservation. Um, so, you know, what I've really gotten out of working with this program, we had an intern at North Carolina Sea Grant via uh, the Diversity and Conservation Internship Program, was that they do a great job with recruitment. One of the struggles that we face um, at North Carolina Sea Grant, and I think in a lot of our Sea Grant programs, is that when we're hiring, you know, like Lamar was saying, we often hire people we already know. We're relying on the professional networks of the search committee, our organizational staff, and often those networks exclude potential minority or diverse candidates, not because they're not qualified necessarily, but because they're not aware of those networks. Um, and so really there's distinct professional networks out there and for a lot of different groups of people and we have to be able to access a wide variety of those and stop just relying on the ones we already know. So by participating in this internship program, we were able to get an intern that I don't believe ever would have known about North Carolina Sea Grant otherwise. Now it was uh, kind of an interesting process in deciding who to hire. Um, when we were initially looking at what intern we would work with, we did have some choices. Many different interns applied for the program. And so some people applied that did know of North Carolina Sea Grant and were in our networks. And uh, it was a little um, challenging to decide, okay, do we hire this person we've worked with before that we know that knows, you know, the project or the program, or do we hire someone who's perhaps you know, has never really worked in this kind of a field, but they're just starting. So we ended up hiring a sophomore um, who had just recently started, she was about to start her junior year um, in geology, and um, she worked with our program without a lot of knowledge of, you know, what we were going to work on. But what we saw in her in the interview process was her drive, her aspirations, her communication skills. Um, you know, Lamar pointed out that, you know, a lot of you know, students may not be exposed to conservation careers, may not think of that as their, um, what they're going for, but if we can open up our opportunities to people beyond the sciences, to students that are perhaps, um, you know, haven't had any work experience <laughs> in the conservation field. You know, she was in the sciences, but the student we ended up hiring, she, you know, her most recent job was working in retail at Target. Um, and so she didn't, you know, when you look at uh, work experience, she didn't shine on that because she hadn't had the same kind of work experience that some folks in our network have. Um, but yet she had, again, the drive, the ambition, the ability to learn. Um, and she had an excellent experience, I believe, and we had an excellent experience with her. But if we hadn't been part of this 
diversity internship program with the goal stated up front, um, I don't know that we would have hired her. I don't know that, you know, we would have made that leap um, and hired someone that, you know, was to us a little bit unknown. Um, so in the last two years, I've applied for this program again to serve as a host uh, supervisor, and we have not gotten an intern. So this is actually a rather competitive program uh, in the state. So conservation organizations um, like land trusts, nonprofits, other science-based organizations can apply for interns. And one thing that this internship program has started to really focus on is trying to understand how the intern, you know, not only, you know, what's the experience that they're going to get, but what footprint are they going to leave on the organization? So through the last couple of years when we haven't been selected, we've had a good back and forth about why. And, um, uh, you know, they basically said, we want to see that the intern is participating in projects that are furthering your equity work overall. And if we don't see that happening in your projects or programs clearly, then, you know, we feel like it's kind of a drop in a bucket. So, you know, you bring someone in, you know, person of color, if that's your goal in diversity, but it's more than that. You know, we also have to think about who we're serving, you know, ultimately with our program. Um, and are they part of, you know, kind of that larger change within the organization? At least that's, you know, kind of the points that they've made to me in the past. Um, so I found that, you know, really valuable kind of back and forth. Um, I guess, uh, Sarah, would you mind going to the next slide? I just have one more slide, and I wonder, could you read it? Uh, it's a quote from one of the previous interns. I'm in the car, so I can't see it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no problem, Jane. Uh, so... Uh, the quote reads, the current conservation field is lacking in diversity, and it is absolutely critical to have emerging conservation leaders such as ourselves who are able to communicate with and relate to this changing constituency. We will soon be the ones with the power to define how our communities interact with our planet. Thanks, Sarah. Um, yeah, I think that's a really powerful um, comment to make. And, you know, since the inception of this program, you know, over the last 10 years, the Conservation Trust, they've now connected 111 interns to land trusts, government agencies, universities, and nonprofits in North Carolina. And more than half of their intern alumni now work or volunteer in conservation organizations. Um, so there's been a lot of success in growing that pipeline. And, you know, a couple of reasons you know, what I see that's so unique about this program, it's not only that they, you know, are forward facing in their commitment to diversity and targeting recruitment, um, you know, very particularly, uh, they're also creating a structure that allows these students to really feel like they're part of something. So, you know, I think it sometimes it's hard to maybe remember back why we got involved in the career paths that we did. Um, I can remember at one point, you know, a friend of mine in college, he told me about the Student Conservation Association. He had worked there one summer. And, um, you know, we were in an environmental club together. And being part of that club, uh, you know, he let me know about this internship. So, I decided I'd do the internship too. And then when I did that internship, I met more people that were interested in conservation and, you know, have now gone on, you know, they're science writers at National Geographic, they're managers um, with the Forest Service. And so, you know, you're, you start this kind of this, this little, this little network and it, and it grows and grows. So what's really cool about this diversity and conservation internship program is the students, although they're at many different conservation organizations throughout the state, they're part of a structured group, so it's a cohort, and they meet, they meet in the beginning of the internship, this is a summer-long program, they meet in the middle, and they meet in the end, and they have, um, you know, they all keep in touch on their phones, they've got, you know, different group chats that they're part of, um, and then they have a lot of back and forth with the conservation trust, um, there's a supervisor there that's supervising the entire internship program, so they're really part, again, of a cohort of people that, you know, my thought is that, you know, they're probably going to stay in touch or they're going to learn from each other and they're learning from like-minded or 
peers, peers that look like themselves, maybe have more similar backgrounds than say the people that they're gonna work with in the host organization. So having that cohort to me is, is just so valuable. And just to kind of end this, you know, one of the priorities that is in the DEI network vision is creating some kind of an internship program for undergrads. You know, we focus a lot of work on graduate students. A lot of our resources um, for students go to the graduate level. I think the undergrads is the next level. So I'm really excited to see the summer scholars program happening at Oregon Sea Grant. We certainly have a role to play in K through 12 as well. Um, but I would love to see some kind of a structured internship program that the Sea Grant programs across the country help to organize um, and then to create a cohort. Uh, I just would love to really kind of replicate the success of this diversity and conservation internship program. Uh, I'll stop there. So thank you very much, Jane. Uh, that was a great uh, example of a, of a good practice. Um, we do have some time for questions. And I think I saw some questions coming in on uh, the chat. Catherine, do you have some questions that you'd like to? Yes, I do. Us? Okay. Um, so we have a question. Um, what are some tools that the US Fish and Wildlife Service has used to address personal staff barriers? So this question is for you, Lamar. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Did you hear the question or would you like me to repeat it? I did. I heard it. Okay. I was great. just trying to I was just trying to get my computer back up and running. So <laughs> <laughs> we've um just recently, I guess it was last week, and we do more of this. Um we do cultural competency trainings. Um my personal favorite way of dealing with it on staff here is um and going into the community and meeting with the community in their space. When we go in their space, it takes the, um, it takes one of the barriers out of the way. So one of the community barriers is you've got a government uniform <clears throat> and you're coming into their community. There's already a little bit of a barrier sitting in front of you that, okay, should I trust these folks? By going into the community, you lose that barrier. Now we have a pretty good relationship with the community now and um, it, it, it's improving, but by getting the staff and conversations with the community, it's probably the most helpful thing. Um, I personally, and I think my staff too, from the conversations we have that surrounds this, by talking about it here on site, but also going out and doing has helped. Now we have had some staff retire. Um, shortly after starting, we've had a little bit of strain with a couple, one left, one stayed, stayed here and has improved significantly. Um, that's gonna happen. And we have to be okay with that if we are interested in intentionally trying to make change in the conservation world. Um, there's gonna be hard decisions. Some folks, you have to walk down the road to where they, they want to leave. Um, but I find the most successful is putting the staff in the conversation with the community and they realize at that point that the folks that we're working with, the folks we're trying to introduce to the conservation world, they're the same as they are. They have different experiences, um, different cultures, different ethnicities, but the same things are important. That's been very important, but a lot of different trainings plus those things. Did that answer the question or are you looking for something else? I think that sounded pretty good to me. Catherine, do you have yeah. a, a, oh. Yes, we have a couple more questions unless anybody had any more, um, wanted to discuss that further. Okay, great. So our next question is for Sarah. Um, we have somebody who was wondering if you could provide an example of a relevant question that you ask in the application and interview process for the fellowships. Yeah, uh, thanks for that question. Uh, so um, the question that was put on the slide about, you know, talking about asking the students, uh, particularly in their applications to 
describe experiences that they've had working with diverse groups or examples of uh, experience um, communicating across difference uh, that they've had and then reflecting on how that might impact their work uh, as a scholar. I mean, basically just trying to get the students or the applicants to really think about, you know, these are some experiences I've had communicating with diversity and this is how I can couple that or how I think that that might couple with um, being part of an agency uh, doing, you know, science work or policy work and kind of trying to, to get them to think about how to connect those two parts of their experience um, so that they're not thinking about, you know, science as separate from community engagement or working with uh, people from different backgrounds. Um, but um, I'm also happy to share, um, it might be more useful to share this over um, email. So feel free to get in touch with me that way. Um, and I'm happy to share materials. Awesome. Um, so I am not sure if this question is directed to any of the three speakers in particular. Um, I'm guessing anybody could maybe take a stab at it, but somebody had wanted um, to have you share the types of careers that a student could work in, um, i.e. policymaker and economic communities or community engagement. I got a question. Is that, is it just in those particular areas? Or were you looking more for whoever asked that question, the breadth of careers? It's see, I'm thinking from their question, they had, they were interested in the breadth of careers. So just somebody who could talk about you know, the different types of careers. Wow, that's a big one. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm gonna say this, there's um, how, how I describe it to students when I talk to them, both high school and college, is that in the Fish and Wildlife Service, we have just about every type of career that you could think about, there would be in a small town. Um, at last count, I think I was, and it's probably not quite that big, but at last count, I was at about 35 different career types. And that ranges from biologists, visitor services managers, realty specialists, accountants, um, veterinarians, uh, people who just deal with managing forests, fishery biologists. There's a lot of different career types that um, have the same skills that you would have in a small town. Um, and, and this is Sarah. I, I'll just say that, you know, one of the uh, real drives behind our summer scholars program was to show students uh, that there are science related careers, policy related careers beyond academia. Um, and so that, you know, a lot of students who are coming out of their undergraduate careers say, well, I'm really interested in science. I like marine stuff. So that means I have to be a professor. And so what we're really trying to do is to show them that there are other options, um, you know, working at a state uh, management agency, working for uh, the federal government, either EPA or USDA, working for nonprofits, um, so that they're, you know, using communication skills, uh, working in education. So really just trying to show them that um, there are other options besides being just like their professors. And I'll add to that um, just to say that, you know, I'm not sure if this was part of the point of that question, but, you know, conservation careers, you don't have to be a scientist at all or come from a natural science background to play an important role in conservation organizations. So, yeah, there are economists, there are policy people, um, you know, there's simply advocates that, you know, are going to be important in, you know, maybe they work in another field entirely, like they're a real estate agent, um, and they have some power in their community that is your influence. And if they have some conservation values or experience, that's going to influence, you know, how they do their work in a field that we may even think of as antagonistic <laughs> to conservation. Um, so, yeah, I, I think the more we can broaden the understanding of what it means to be in ocean, marine, Great Lakes, 
uh, you know, kind of to be focused on those issues um, that we're going to bring more people into the fold. Ditto. Okay, it's getting uh, it's getting a little late. Uh, do we have any more questions? Maybe we could take one more question before wrap, wrapping up, if there is one. Okay, well, I'd like to really uh, thank everyone for joining today. Um, and uh, I'd like to thank our, our presenters, uh, particularly Lamar and uh, also Sarah and Jane. And so this uh, webinar will be archived on, on the National Sea Grant website and we'll get some uh, email out to you once it's, it's ready and posted. So I hope everyone has uh, a great weekend. And if anyone has a, a parting thought, please weigh in in the chat and then uh, have, have a great rest of your Friday. Thank you. Bye. If you have any other questions, just email me. Thanks, Anne. Thanks, Anne.